Okay, so here they're saying that the molecular mass of butyric acid was determined by experiment to be 88 gram per mole. Fine. What is the molecular formula? The empirical formula is given to you as C2H4O. So basically, what is the idea of empirical formula and molecular formula? You know that empirical formula, whatever it is, C2H4O, taken n times, will give you the molecular formula that is C2N, H4N, O, N, right? Which means the molecular mass, uh, sorry, the empirical formula mass that you get multiplied by N will give you the molar mass or the molecular mass, okay? You can find out the empirical formula mass you have been provided by uh, with the molar mass, find out N and that N will be multiplied on top, right? In the chemical uh, formula right or the molecular formula or with the empirical formula to give us the molecular formula okay this is what we're going to do so let's get started we have c2h4o so what is going to be the mass of this entity c2h4o so you have uh, 12 into 2 for carbons plus 4 sorry plus 4 plus 16 for one oxygen so you have 24 plus 20 which is nothing but 44 grams Okay, so your empirical formula mass came out to be 44 multiplied by n is equal to nt, uh, sorry, 88, which is the uh, molecular mass that is given to us. So n is going to come out to be 88 by 44, which is nothing but 2. So basically, what is my final molecular formula? It's going to be C4H8O2. C4H8O2 is right here in option A. So option A, C4H8O2 is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're saying that in which of the following is nitrogen in the SP hybridization state? Okay, so basically what do we know about SP hybridization? We know that if the steric number is equal to 2, then I can say that my central atom is SP2, sorry, is SP hybridized. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's see where we can find the steric number equal to 2. So in all the cases that we're going to consider, we will take nitrogen as the central atom and then we will see, you know, what is the steric number accordingly. Okay. So how many electrons does nitrogen have? It has 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. It has 5 electrons in its valence shell. Okay. So now let's see we're starting off with option A, CH3 taken thrice N. Okay. Now you have nitrogen, you have this, right? So this will be a lone pair and this will go for bonding with the individual methyl um, ions. So here you have steric number is equal to three bond pairs, one lone pair steric number is equal to four. So this is going to be sp3 hybridized, not sp hybridized. I am discarding it. Then we have option B, CH3CONH2 acetamide. So this looks like this. Let's say that the entire group here, CH3CO, is one group. Basically, I want you to know that acetamide has a structure like this. C double bond O, NH2. Okay, so here what can I say? I can say that this entire thing is one entity with respect to nitrogen. Okay, that, that's just one group that is bonded to nitrogen. And then you have two different hydrogen atoms here. Okay, so still you have only three groups that are bonded to nitrogen and one lone pair, which means again here steric number is equal to four. It will be sp3 hybridized, not sp. So, well, not our answer. Then you have option C, NO2 plus. So in case of NO2 plus, nitrogen does not start off with four, uh, sorry, with five electrons. It loses one electron. Now you're talking about N plus as the central atom, right? So you have four electrons available for bonding, in which case this happens, okay? This is what happens and you can see that here the steric number is going to be equal to two because you have only two bond pairs, right? You have two sigma bond pairs. You have the pi bonds also, but we don't count that for hybridization, correct? So here is steric number is two, which means yes, this is going to be sp hybridized and hence this is going to be the answer that we wanted. So option C, NO2 plus is going to be the right answer to this question. 
So here they're saying the thermal decomposition of potassium chlorate is as follows. Reaction given to you is 2 KClO3 gives you 2 KCl plus 3 O2. Right? Here, law of mass action and uh, basically they're asking if it can be applied, cannot be applied, can be applied at low temperature or can be applied at high temperature and pressure. So, see, fundamentally this is a question from chemical equilibrium, right? They're trying to see if, you know, what happens to law of mass action here? That is what they're trying to test. But you need to remember that law of mass action is applicable only to a system that is in equilibrium. This is why we study it in chemical equilibrium, right? Not, not mole concept or anything. We study law of mass action in chemical equilibrium, which means the fundamental requirement for applying this principle or applying this law is that the system has to be in equilibrium. And here you don't have a backward reaction, you don't have a reverse reaction, you only have the reaction moving in the forward direction which means there is no equilibrium for the system which means you cannot apply law of mass action at any condition as long as it is not a reversible reaction. Okay, so here you do not have the backward reaction which means there is no reversible reaction which means there is no equilibrium in the system which means we cannot apply law of mass action so option a cannot be applied is going to be the right answer to this question okay so here they're saying that a gas at a pressure of 5 bar is heated from 0 degrees celsius to 546 degrees celsius and simultaneously compressed to one third of its original volume. Hence, the final pressure is going to be what? Okay. So, we are looking at the ideal gas equation here. We have to figure out which things to keep and which things to discard. That is what is a constant and what is a variable. So, they are saying that pressure is changing, temperature is changing and volume is changing. Which means R, which is anyway a constant, I am going to discard it. And number of moles is a constant here. So, my formula becomes PV by T is a constant, which means P1V1 by T1 is equal to P2V2 by T2, right? But T1 is given to us as 0 degree Celsius, which means this entire thing became infinity, right? Or 1 by 0 undefined. Ah, no, no, no. It's given as 0 degree Celsius. We have to convert it to Kelvin, right? We've come so far in our journey and now if you make such a mistake, it's, I don't know, let's start over then. <laughs> it's okay, right? So here temperature has to be in Kelvin. Be very sure of that. This is going to be 273 Kelvin. This is going to be 273 plus 546. Or alternatively, because I know I have to cancel things out, I'm going to write this as 273 into 3 Kelvin. Same value, numerically same value. I am just trying to make our life easier and reduce calculations because you know me, I'm lazy, <laughs> right? Anyway, so here pressure initially was 5 bar, so 5 multiplied by volume. They're not spoken about the volume in terms of liters, but they're, they're just saying that initial volume was compressed to one third of its value. So I'm going to call it V and V by 3. So here will be V divided by temperature which is 273 Kelvin. Final pressure P2 multiplied by V2 is going to be V by 3. So V by 3 into temperature 2. T2 is 273 into 3. So 273 into 3. Now when you cancel this, this and this gets cancelled. V and V will get cancelled. Your P2 pressure is going to be 9 into 5 which is 45. And what are the units? You will notice that I have not played around with the units. I have not made any unit conversion. So, a uh, unit of pressure is going to be what was originally given to us. That is bar. So, this is going to be 45 bar. And that is here in option A. So, option A 45 bar is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're saying that one mole of an ideal gas expands isothermally and reversibly at 25 degrees Celsius from a volume of 10 liters to a volume of 20 liters. What is the change in entropy of the gas? Okay, so what are they asking us? They are asking us for the value of delta S. Okay, this is an isothermal reversible expansion. The question itself is such a giveaway. They've told you that's an 
isothermal reversible expansion so what you can do here is directly go ahead and apply the formula don't you know if you want if you want to derive it from first principles yes be my guest do that uh, go for delta h go for uh, q then do q by t uh, q reversible by t then you will get delta s absolutely i am just going to use the formula here because i want to save my time on something like thermodynamics and not you know waste too much time thinking about it if you remember the formula great if you don't then yes you are always always welcome to derive it whatever works for you log of v final by v initial this is what you get okay so here everything is given to you and this is in because it is one mole i have not written n because here you will have n also it's one mole so i have taken the liberty of ignoring n okay so your delta s here is going to be 2.303 into r look at your options your options are in joule per kelvin so take r as 8.314 okay so you have 8.314 sorry it will not be t it will be only r right because you have divided it by t you have taken q and you have divided it by t so there is going to be no t here log of v final which is 20 by v initial which is Two. So, two, sorry, ten. Okay. Now you need to know that in the question you have not uh, you have not been provided with the value of log two. So log two, log three, log five have these three values on your tips like log uh, log two, log three, log five, and even how to convert it to the natural logarithm, how to convert it to log two, log three, log five. You should know that. You should be confident about it. If you know these three values, then you can derive almost any other value by using the basic laws of logarithm. Okay. So this is what we have. So log 2, I'll take it as 0.3. I have 2.303 into 8.314 into 0.3. I'm doing 2.303 into 0.3. So I get uh, 996. Okay. Multiplied by 0.1, multiplied by 8.314. So you saw that I took 2.303 and multiplied it only by 3. So that's why I wrote a 0.1 there, just to ensure that I'm not making the mistake later. Now, what do you have? Okay, my options are pretty far enough. So, I do have enough scope for uh, approximation. So, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to approximate 6.909 to 7. Okay, so now I have uh, 0.7 into 8.314 basically, right? So, I'm going to go ahead and write 8.314 as 8.3 and multiply that with 7 and then we'll see what the answer comes out. So, we have 1 and then we have, um, what do we have? 8 7 is 56 plus 2, 58, right? 58.1, but it's 0.7, so it will become 5.81. Great. 5.81 Joule Kelvin inverse. This is your change in entropy for the given reaction or for the given process, right? Because it's, therm it's thermodynamics. It's not a reaction anymore. It's a process. Okay. So this is 5.81 Joule per Kelvin. Your option B, 5.76 Joule per Kelvin is very close, right? It is, in fact, the only option suitable considering the value we have gotten. So option B, 5.76 Joule per Kelvin is going to be the right answer to this question.